Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Wilson. I'll be moderating this afternoon's session. I want to welcome all of you back. We have a really great lineup, uh, and it's a particular pleasure and an honor to introduce our uh, our first speaker, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is uh, the inaugural Surgeon General of the State of California. And uh, the title of her talk is going to be From Research to Remedy, Applying the Science of Toxic Stress to Improve Clinical Care at Scale. Nadine, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Matt. It's great to be here. I have to say this is my favorite conference ever, um, always, uh, um, whenever I attend. And I just want to thank you, uh, Barbara, for inviting me. This morning has been, uh, I mean, what a powerhouse lineup of folks talking about um, uh, just a range of, of topics that I think are really, really deeply interconnected. And I'm eager to just dive in and talk about how we take a lot of the, uh, take the science and apply it in a way that is useful and changes lives and helps to change the world. Um, and if we can uh, bring up the presentation. Let me see, I don't, um, my understanding is that there is someone who will bring up my, my um, presentation, is that right? We can open it. We had it down as you opening it, but it'll be open in a moment. Oh, my team had told me that it was that you guys would be um, running it. I'm sorry. Um, uh, which I think is probably, yeah, that might be best. Okay, so in the meantime, um, you know, so what we heard from the beginning from the inspiration of Brian Stevenson uh, through hearing about how the, the maternal, uh, the, the prenatal environment influences brain development to the role of housing policy and immigration policy. Um, for me, there is a clear through line through all of this. Like my, my brain is just lighting up. And part of that um, through line and what we've heard today is the role of trauma in health and well-being and the development of health conditions. And um, so what I'm gonna do is talk today about how, um, about how uh, trauma, about how uh, especially early life trauma shapes brain development, shapes the development of our health and well-being and how that ultimately impacts our uh, risk of health conditions and then how we use that science to change outcomes at scale. Um, okay, here we go. So, um, uh, so from research to remedy, applying the science of toxic stress to improve clinical scale, uh, clinical care at scale. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so, Many of you uh, may be familiar, and if you've ever seen me talk at this conference before, you'll know that a lot of my focus, a lot of my uh, work and research is on adverse childhood experiences. And that comes from the study that was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente now over two decades ago. And in that study, they looked at 10 specific criteria of childhood adversity. These included physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household with parents who um, have experienced mental illness, have uh, parental uh, uh, substance dependence, uh, intimate partner violence, parental incarceration, uh, or parental separation or divorce. And what that study found, next slide please, was uh, a couple of things. Number one is that these adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are incredibly common. So nationally, we see this very recent data from the CDC that show that almost two thirds, 61.6% .6 of US adults have experienced at least one ACE and 15.8% have experienced four or more ACEs. In California, um, my home state, 
Uh, we're at 62.3% experience at least one and 16.3% with four more ACEs. And then as we, um, as we look at the data across racial and ethnic groups, what we see is that the prevalence of ACEs is, is actually pretty similar across racial and ethnic groups when it comes to the 10 traditional ACEs, right? Um, uh, but we see that African-American, uh, Hispanic and Latino and Native American uh, individuals uh, groups uh, tend to uh, experience slightly higher ACEs. You know, one of the things that's interesting about this is that we know the original Kaiser CDC study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. Um, so we know that this happens in all communities. But one of the things that's important is that vulnerable and marginalized communities experience, may experience higher rate of other adversities like racism or discrimination, and uh, may also uh, and, and may also have fewer resources by which to address the ways in which early adversity poses a health risk. And what we now know, right, is that, okay, so we have the data that ACEs are incredibly common. Uh, what the CDC study found was that there was a dose response relationship between these adverse childhood experiences and negative health outcomes. And over the past uh, several decades, we begin to explore the biological mechanisms for how this happens, right? So we've heard this, we've heard that trauma especially in childhood, is damaging to our physical health, our mental health. We've, we've seen multiple examples of that in today's conference, but now we want to understand why, because when we understand the mechanism, that gives us tools to be able to unpack this on a number of different levels. So if we move forward to the next slide. And what we now understand is, um, is you know, what was summarized by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in their 2019 consensus report, right? That the toxic stress response, when, we, when people talk about toxic stress, sometimes they, they use it to refer to the stressor. When we know as, as scientists and as health professionals, the term toxic stress actually refers to the physiological stress response, right? And that it refers to the prolonged activation of our stress response systems that can disrupt the development of brain architecture and other organ systems and increase the risk of stress-related disease and cognitive impairment well into the adult years. Next slide, please. And we recognize the powerful thing about the ACE study is that, um, that ACEs are powerful risk factors for toxic stress, for the development of the toxic stress response, right? but that they're not the only risk factors for development of the toxic stress response. And that there are other circumstances, exposures or conditions that have documented association with increased likelihood of development of the toxic stress response. So in addition to ACEs, other risk factors include poverty, exposure to discrimination, exposure to the atrocities of war, right? And we've heard about some of that in today's uh, conversation. Next slide, please. So um, if there's one thing that I want to get across, it's that adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress represent a public health crisis. They are the root cause of some of the most harmful, persistent, and expensive health and societal challenges facing our world today. And as I mentioned, what the CDC and Kaiser found was that there was this dose response relationship between ACEs and some of the most common health concerns that we see in the United States and globally. Next slide, please. And what we see here is a list of the 10, this, uh, the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Um, and this is actually, it's interesting, COVID was just recently added to the list. And so this, is, this needs to be updated to include COVID. But what we see is that, um, the, when we look at the 10 leading causes of death um, in the United States, and then the second column are the odds ratios uh, for these health conditions for individuals who have four or more ACEs. And so individuals who have four or more ACEs 
uh, their odds of developing heart disease uh, 2.1 as compared to someone with zero ACEs, cancer 2.3, accidents 2.6, chronic uh, lung disease 3.1, stroke 2.0, Alzheimer's 11.2, diabetes 1.4, kidney disease 1.7, suicide attempts 37.5. ACEs dramatically increase the risk for nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States, right? That's the definition of a public health crisis, something that affects a lot of people and something where the, the effects or the impacts are significant. And the effects are not only to our health, but if you look at the next slide, please, what we see is that the cost of ACEs is staggering. In California alone, we looked at uh, the cost of ACEs that were attributable from only eight health conditions, asthma, arthritis, COPD, depression, smoking, cardiovascular disease, heavy drinking, and obesity. And the annual cost to the state of California was $112.5 billion per year in direct healthcare costs and lost productivity. Similarly, analysis has been done to for, of the cost of ACEs. Uh, again, looking at these health conditions, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, anxiety, depression, harmful alcohol use, and illicit drugs. Uh, and that total uh, gl globally, looking at North America and Europe is $1.3 trillion per year, right? So um, again, we see a profound cost, both in terms of uh, physical, mental, and emotional health, uh, well being, and also in terms of direct healthcare costs and lost productivity. Next slide, please. So, to be able to interrupt this progression from early adversity and disease and early death, we have to understand the biology of adversity. Next slide, please. And what we understand is that we have early life adversity and that can be, uh, that can occur in the setting of predisp uh, predisposing vulnerability. Um, and it can be buffered by protective factors. And that this early life adversity leads to the activation of the physiologic stress response, release of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, when we activate our stress response, we also activate our immune response, right? And so as a result, we have neuroendocrine immune and genetic regulatory changes that constitute the toxic stress response. And this is what leads to the long-term increased risk for the nine out of 10 leading causes of death um, and other health conditions, right? Um, next slide, please. And if we dive in a little bit more deeply, right? Um, and I, part of the reason I love this conference is because it's the place where I get to um, uh, kind of use both sides of my brain, right? Like I get to be the, the, the science nerd a little bit. And I, I, can, I know I can speak to an audience that will appreciate that, for example, when we're talking about predisposed vulnerability, we're talking about, for example, when there are variations in the serotonin uh, receptor, right? The different, the different um, types of serotonin receptors that, um, uh, that we can see different outcomes, the same dose of adversity may lead to different outcomes based on genetic predisposition or genetic vulnerability, right? So uh, similarly differences in things, uh, uh, factors like uh, uh, you know, brain-derived neurotrophic factor or um, uh, other, other um, uh, neurotransmitter receptors, et cetera, can affect how uh, the exposure of early adversity ends up being translated into uh, increased risk of disease or early death. But essentially, we see that these exposures, these changes in stress hormones lead to differences in how our DNA is methylated, right? They lead to differences in our uh, epigenetic regulation, which leads to differences in how our genes are read and transcribed. 
And that's what leads to these long-term changes in the, uh, our, our brain's fear response center, right? The HPA axis, our uh, brain's, uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which leads to the activation of our biological stress response and the release of um, uh, stress hormones, which ultimately impact the functioning of almost every cell in the body, right? And that leads to changes in the volume of key, uh, the volume and the activity of key uh, brain regions leads to neurotransmitter changes and altered functional activity and tract connectivity of, uh, in terms of neurodevelopmental disruption. And we recognize that timing is key as well, right? So um, when, when this adversity occurs during uh, sensitive or critical periods of development, right? We, we see this outsized impact in terms of long-term health development and uh, risk of uh, developing health conditions later on. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we know about the toxic stress response, right, is that our physiologic stress response occurs actually in a spectrum. And we have the the, uh, you know, that our biological stress response is a normal and healthy part of development. We have our positive, tolerable, and toxic stress response. And the difference between our tolerable stress response and the toxic stress response sits in, the, in, in this middle um, column here, right? Where we understand that homeostasis can recover through the buffering effect of caring adults and other interventions. Right? So what we know and what the science shows us is that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments can actually be the difference between the tolerable stress response where homeostasis is able to recover and the toxic stress response where we see prolonged activation of the stress response, disruption in brain architecture, and increased risk of uh, stress-related uh, disease uh, and other disorders. Next slide, please. And what we understand is that the impacts of uh, toxic stress uh, go beyond neurodevelopment, right? So we, you know, I talked a little bit about the, the impact on neurodevelopment, but also a recognition, right? To the point of, we recognize there's a role of inflammation on neurodevelopment. We recognize that interleukins, right? And, and, and other inflammatory mediators and markers have an impact on our health and development and that our stress response not only affects brain development, but also in, it, it impacts our, the, the development of our immune system, right? And, um, and our, our gut microbiome, right? So we see increased um, risk of infection, autoimmune disorders, cancers, chronic inflammation, and cardiometabolic disorders as a result of the changes to our immunologic and inflammatory profiles. We see long-term changes to our hormonal system with changes in growth, development, metabolism, and pubertal uh, events, uh, leading to a clinical risk of overweight, obesity, cardiometabolic disorders, and insulin resistance. We see, um, and then I talked about how this is mediated uh, in part through changes in epi epigenetic regulation, uh, which can also mediate increased risk of disease. Next slide, please. So now that we understand the science, the mechanism behind toxic stress, California is taking a public health approach to addressing toxic stress. Next slide, please. And it starts with recognizing that we have more opportunity than we ever have before through advances in science to interrupt the toxic stress response, to break the intergenerational cycle of ACEs and toxic stress and promote an intergenerational cycle of health. And it starts with early identification and evidence-based intervention. And what all of the data and the science tells us is that this can improve brain, immune, hormonal, and genetic regulatory control of development. And so treatment of toxic stress in adults, right, may also prevent transmission of the neuroendocrine immune uh, metabolic and genetic regulatory disruptions in offspring. Next slide. So what we've done in California is we've actually tr trained our doctors on how to screen 
for adverse childhood experiences, which is our most evidence-based tool for assessing for early adversity, right? To, to, to screen in primary care and to uh, essentially assess risk of a toxic stress response. So we understand that if someone has, uh, you know, so a, a patient might fill out a form uh, in the exam room, we actually do a, we actually recommend a de-identified screen where patients only uh, reveal the number of ACEs they have experienced and not which ones. And the answer is either a zero or a score of one to three um, or four or more, right? And with that information, we can assess whether our, um, whether or not the patient is at low risk of toxic stress, right? We're not gonna say no risk because ACEs only assess for some of the risk factors for toxic stress, but whether they're at low risk, whether they're at intermediate risk or whether they're at high risk for toxic stress. And our team of experts convened by the Office of the Surgeon General has actually created this clinical algorithm to allow clinicians to understand what are the next steps, right? So the next step is to assess for associated health conditions and then determine response and follow up. Next slide, please. So when we talk about associated health conditions, you know, one of the things that's really um, interesting is that when we think about associated health conditions, the most glaring, the most obvious, the most well-recognized are the behavioral or the neuropsychiatric impacts of, uh, of early adversity and toxic stress. But as we share this uh, list of ACE associated health conditions with our healthcare providers, we also recognize things like asthma, allergies, eczema, right? Those immune, uh, those immune mediated consequences of early adversity, increased infections, poor dental health, right? All of these. And so what this list of ACE associated health conditions does is help providers do a better job in recognizing both the neuropsychiatric as well as the non-neuropsychiatric consequences of toxic stress. Next slide, please. And, and with that, uh, our, our clinical advisory subcommittee, our, our team of experts has really created um, a step. So how do, you, how do we implement this clinically, right? Well, number one, it starts with applying the principles of trauma-informed care, establishing trust, safety, and collaborative decision-making. Number two, supplementing usual care, uh, supplementing usual care for ACE-associated health conditions like diabetes, by providing patient education on toxic stress and offering strategies to regulate the stress response, right? So if I, as a physician, have a patient who's insulin resistant and they have ha experienced seven ACEs, if I recognize that the trauma that they've experienced is likely contributing to their insulin resistance, right, then offering them strategies on how to mitigate the toxic stress response, regulate those stress hormones is an important part of that treatment strategy, right? Part of the way to do that is by validating existing strengths and protective factors, connecting patients through referrals to resources and interventions such as educational materials, social work, school agencies, care coordination or mental health or community health workers, and then following up as necessary using that ACE associated health condition as an indicator of treatment progress. So if it was diabetes, how's the diabetes doing? Is it well controlled? Is it poorly controlled? Next slide, please. And one of the big myths out there that it kind of drives me the most crazy is like, there's no treatment for toxic stress. That's nonsense. We have lots of evidence of interventions that help to regulate the stress response and are associated with clinically improved outcomes including, so for example, MRI studies found that children who were institutionalized, right, who were randomized into high quality nurturing caregiving actually showed normalization of the developmental trajectory of the white matter structures of their brain. We see that responsive caregiving improves cortisol reactivity in children. Time in nature, right? And we heard about the built environment. We heard all of these things. Time in nature reduces sympathetic nervous system activity and increases parasympathetic activity, right? This is measurable. They actually did EEG studies on folks that had them walk through the city and then had them walk through beautiful nature and saw the difference in the activation of different parts of their brain, right? And so we see this from on the immuno how we regulate our immunologic function, endocrine and metabolic, 
uh, and even epigenetic, right? That we see that nurturant caregiving is actually associated with epigenetic changes. So this nonsense about there's no treatment for toxic stress um, is a myth. And one of the things that we've been doing in California is educating our healthcare providers on how they can take this science out of the journals, right? And put it into practice to improve their patient's health. Next slide, please. And we do that, you know, part of it is simplifying into kind of, uh, you know, we call this our, our wellness wheel. It's just a very simple uh, way of, of showing folks how sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships, and time in nature, right, experiencing nature, all have helped to reduce stress hormones, reduce inflammation, and enhance neuroplasticity right, which all combats the, the toxic stress response. Next slide, please. But once we have, once our healthcare providers identify, right, uh, these risk factors, then the next piece and, and are, applying, um, are, are, are applying interventions clinically, right, we also recognize that the in the clinic, it's not the only place where we need uh, resources to address toxic stress because so much of our environments are the factors in which toxic stress is generated, right? And so one of the things that we did in California was to help to create and invest in a trauma-informed network of care, which includes an interdisciplinary group of health, education, human service professionals, community members, and organizations. They support families by providing access to evidence-based buffering resources and supports and helps to prevent, treat, and heal the harmful consequences of toxic stress. Next slide, please. And so this year, we invested $30 million for 35 grants covering 27 counties in California. Eight communities received implementation grants of $3 million each to build this trauma-informed network of care, and 27 communities received $300,000 planning grants to figure out how they can bring these folks together to design a trauma-informed network of care in their communities. Next slide, please. So uh, to date, we've trained over 17,000 primary care providers um, in the la you know, since we launched this program in January of 2020. Uh, and as a result, Medi-Cal Medi providers have screened more than 300,000 patients in California for ACEs between January and September of 2020. Next slide. But we know that in the exam room and in healthcare alone is not the only place that where, where these solutions are. And so when we talk about how we address uh, toxic stress at a societal level on a public health scale, Number one, we know that we need primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, or prevention, early detection, and early and effective evidence-based intervention, right? So we need to prevent it from happening. We need to identify it early by doing routine screening, like what we're doing in California, and then we need to provide access to high-quality treatment. And then we also recognize that that prevention, early intervention, and, uh, and, um, and treatment needs to happen not just in healthcare where we're specifically targeting the toxic stress response, but in public health, in social services, in early childhood, in education, in justice, in all of our policy making, right? Around how we can be part of prevention, early recognition and evidence-based intervention. And with that, I will pause and take questions. Great, thank you very much, Nadine. It's, a, it's really inspiring to see how much you've been able to do from your early work, sort of taking it to, to scale in, you know, in California. Um, uh, I thought I would actually throw in one question. You know, I recall you know, the, you know, the last time you talked where you were talking about uh, like sort of early childhood stress mitigation. I recall, I'm not sure if it was you or someone else who talked about for instance, mindfulness and meditation, even in young children and how effective that was. And so thinking about these kind of early mitigation, stress mitigation strategies, how does that relate to uh, the sort of the concept of resilience or sort of arming, uh, you know, kids and adults to actually deal and respond to 
these stressors and how you, you know, how that sort of fits into the larger strategy. So um, this is something that I think that a lot of the, the researchers who are part of the, the Peak Hour Center can be a part of helping to answer this question. Because I think that when we talk about resilience too often, we're talking about absence of neuropsychiatric uh, symptomatology, right? People say, oh my goodness, in fact, this is a true story. I, you know, I was talking with someone about this work and she said, oh my God, you've got to talk to my girlfriend. She's a psychologist. She wrote a book on resilience. Absolutely. It's amazing. You've got to talk to her. Um, here's her contact information. Uh, Cause you know, she experienced ACEs, you know, in her childhood and she's doing great now. And she's teaching about resilience. Here's your contact information, reach out to her, but don't call her now because she's in the hospital. She just had a heart attack, right? And how we define resilience, I think, really has to um, include a, a recognition of the broad range of outcomes, both um, neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental, as well as immunologic, hormonal, et cetera, right? Genetic regulatory. And I think that where the science has a huge opportunity here is to help us better understand um, uh, markers of resilience, right? Like how do we know when, um, how, how do we know when individuals, when, when we do an intervention, when we do a healing intervention, right? Um, whether or not we are truly restoring health, right? Whether we are truly, uh, helping that individual get to um, optimal functioning. And I think that is a, uh, something that, you know, folks are looking at biomarkers, folks are looking at other, other measures, but I think all of this is a part of, of resilience, uh, which really is about, you know, restoring to uh, optimal functioning. Thank you. We've got uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, one question is, uh, from uh, uh, Bill Kleinbecker, is there any way that commercial companies, either as employers or as providers of IT technology, can get involved and in what areas? I think there are many ways that commercial companies can get involved. So there's a, there are a couple. So um, this is when we when we're talking about two thirds of Americans who have experienced at least one ACE. Um, there, one way that commercial companies can get involved is by um, pursuing opportunities to create solutions, right? So, you know, when we recognize that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are healing, I think more and more we are seeing um, uh, commercial entities that are recognizing this opportunity and looking for a business opportunity around that, right? Like you got, you got to make your money somehow, might as well make your money by being part of the solution to a problem that two thirds of Americans have, right? So that, so that I think is um, um, really true. And, you know, some folks are doing that in terms of, um, you know, we see a huge offering now. One of the, one of the, the silver linings of the pandemic is that, for example, uh, it's never been easier to access a therapist, right? Like people are doing Zoom therapy and, you know, FaceTime therapy and all kinds of things. So there are these interventions that, you know, the, the mindfulness and meditation apps that have sprung up on my phone. I have three different meditation apps on my phone, right? And so, and, and even, you know, the iPhone, like will track your, your mindfulness hours. So there are ways that I think commercial entities can build these into their, their core business workings and offerings. But also when we're talking about two thirds of Americans have experienced ACEs, that's your workforce, right? So things like, um, and I think this is where commercial entities have a huge opportunity to be a driver, things like paid family leave, opportunities for parents to bond to their children, with their children, um, or even whether or not your uh, organization offers mental health care in parity with physical health care, right? You have an opportunity to be an economic driver to addressing these, 
um, challenges as well, right? So I think there, there are two very important roles to play. I think um, commercial entities also have huge platforms and there's an opportunity to raise awareness around these issues through your platforms and your communications and marketing efforts. Great, thank you, Nadine. Uh, there are more questions, but um, in the interest of staying on time, I think uh, I'll thank Nadine for a wonderful presentation uh, and then move on to our uh, next panel discussion.